So I'll start out, um, just wanted to say thanks to the partners who funded and worked on this project together with Alternatives North and myself, Arctic Energy Alliance, uh, Canadian Association of Physicians for the Environment, Ecology North, and uh, the Public Service Alliance of Canada Social Justice Fund. They all helped with Alternatives North, but that said, this was partly a volunteer effort where Alternatives North is an organization of volunteers and they helped to review the whole report and suggest a lot of edits and that kind of stuff. And the whole budget for this covered about two weeks of time, so don't get your hopes up too high. On the other hand, I've been thinking about renewable energy since the late 80s, so they got a lot for their money, <laughs> maybe. So, yeah, why are we going to talk about this? And why did Alternatives North want to talk about this? Well, just over a year ago, this agreement was signed in Paris, the, the uh, Paris Agreement on Climate Change. And we finally got almost 200 leaders together, and they all agreed to the same target of limiting warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius. You can see somewhere down here, there's Barack Obama. And somewhere way down there, there's Justin Trudeau. I think he's got his shirt on. And <laughs> anyway, if you think about this, it's, it's pretty rare to get that many leaders to agree on anything. So even if yourself you're not convinced about all the 97% of scientists who are saying that climate change is an issue and it's caused by humans, if you're a business person, you like certainty. You need to know where the world is going. And right there, you have 200 world leaders telling you that they're all going to do the same thing. So that is also pretty rare, getting that kind of certainty if you're in the business world. So they agreed to try to keep the global warming below uh, one and a half degrees. So far, we're at 0 0.8 degrees worldwide. And that it seems to be working out that in the Northwest Territories, we're getting triple that. So we're already close to three degrees of warming. And it's more so up by Nuvik, and about two degrees in around the Yellowknife region. And there have been some studies that have come out that started to look at, okay, well, if we want to do this one and a half degrees, what do we have to do in terms of emissions to get there? And so they're showing this is what will happen if nothing, if no action is taken. And this indicates getting us up to about four and a half degrees global warming, 15 degrees warming in the Northwest Territories, which if you look at some of the studies would put, Hay River would become a grassland prairie and around here would be a really good place to grow maple trees. So we're talking about big changes if there's no action. This is what Canada's kind of committed to do, which is on the very top end of all these scenarios that they run in a computer. And you'll see, if you can see the little words, it says this is to get us within one and a half to two degrees of warming. This isn't to get us to this target. And the interesting thing, if you look at these, all these models, is they're saying now that we actually can't, they can't get a model where we're going to get below one and a half degrees warming. We're going to go over, and then hopefully, if we really get our act together, we can get back down by the end of the century. So for a little while, it's going to go over two degrees, over one and a half, and then hopefully come back down. And to do that, now we've got big institutions like the World Bank and the the UN Climate Change Panel saying we need to switch to 100% renewable energy by the middle of the century so that we can get that bump and get back down to one and a half degrees. So that's the motivation between why, why we're looking at 100% renewable and why we chose 2050 as, as the date to look at. And also around this time when this was happening, in the media, or in the, you would see all these different studies coming out. There started to be studies showing, okay, what's Canada's path to 100% renewal? What's California's path? What's Europe's path? And there are all these different studies. So Alternatives North thought, well, let's see if the, those paths would actually work in the North too. And we'll get to that. So, well, so they hired me. So I should tell you a little bit about myself. Um, I grew up in Labrador in a small community called Makovic about 300 people. It's very similar to, say, Little Cay or even somewhere up on the, on the coast, like maybe Tuk, Tuk Tuk Tuk. I grew up there and uh, ended up going to high school in Goose Bay. And in, in 1989, I represented Labrador at the National Science Fair. And my project was on solar power in Labrador. And so ever since then, I've been interested in 
both the north, because I loved growing up in Labrador, and in renewable energy. And that's what led me to become, to take engineering at University of Waterloo. And then eventually I, got, I did a master's on energy planning in the north, and I decided I wanted to live in the north again. And I ended up coming here because the Arctic Energy Alliance was doing a new program on community energy planning. So then I've been going, I spent a lot of time visiting different communities in the north and doing energy plans. This was like 10 years ago now. So I've been here since then, the last 12 years, and now I, I work as a consultant on and renewable stuff. So I was very happy to get this little contract. So I'm, like I mentioned, I'm an engineer, and I take an engineering approach to this stuff. We've got science, that's what I was showing you. Science is showing you the models and the certainty of what is happening. But to fix it, this is an engineering problem. At least I see it as an engineering problem. That's applying science and business to get applicable technologies that are actually going to do something. And so taking an engineering approach to this, we need to figure out, okay, if we're going to go to 100% renewables, what is, where are we at now? What, what is our breakdown? And so being low budget, we took the last publication from the government, which was five years ago. But things haven't changed that much since then. So back about five years ago, we were running at about 8% renewable energy, and that was half hydroelectricity and half wood and wood pellets. The rest of it is all imported fossil fuel, mostly heating oil and diesel, and natural gas, which is coming up mostly in Norman Wells, where they're, 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 there's an oil well there, but natural gas comes up with the oil, and they use the natural gas in their facility and actually push a lot of it back down into the earth to squeeze more oil out. But that's why natural gas shows up as such a big amount. And the good news is that if you went five years further back, this 4% was probably closer to 1%. And that is because in around 2006, the price of oil went up. It almost doubled. And we're on oil for everything, heating oil and diesel. And what that meant was that both the government and big building owners like Northern Properties started putting in wood pellet boilers, and they did it really quickly. And so that meant in, in just a few years, we went from very little on the heating side for renewable energy to half of our renewable energy coming from heat. So that shows that there are things happening here, and one of them is the wood pellet boiler thing, and that's actually... Northwest Territories has some of the, the, the largest amount of North American installed wood pellet boilers. The other thing you have to look at, okay, that's the supply, then where is it going? All this fuel is coming in. Where is it going? It's interesting, for some reason, when I say energy, anybody says energy, they think of electricity. And so we end up spending a lot of time talking about this part especially electricity generation in the communities, which is diesel generators. And everybody thinks, man, the worst thing about living in the north is that we have to generate our electricity with diesel, and that's causing climate emissions and all this stuff. But if you actually look at where is it all going, it's less than 10% of the fuel is going to communities for diesel generation. Space heating is double that. And then transportation is triple the amount of fuel that we use in in diesel generation, and the same with industry. Heat and power in industry, which is mostly Norman Wells plus the diamond mines in that, at that time, is using all the rest of the fuel. And a good part of this transportation fuel, probably half of it, is also used in the mines, where the big trucks that are driving the ore around, is, uh, it's, also, it's classified as transportation. So more than, we say roughly half of all our energy use, fuel use, is actually in the industry in mining. And so that's good to keep in mind when we ta talk about solutions and where to focus our effort. We have to replace all of that stuff. So like I was saying, engineering, we look at what is technically viable, and then we are always asked to look at what's economically the most affordable. And then in some cases, say we have a, an enlightened employer, they also ask you to look at social impacts and envi other environmental impacts of, of the work of the technology. So in this case, we had Alternatives North, Physicians for the Environment, and some of the unions. So we established a whole bunch of criteria for 
how we want to evaluate which technologies we should use. And um, I'll just go through them briefly, but the rest of the presentation is sort of based around these criteria. And this is the same in the report. We set up the criteria and then we looked at every option and ranked every, every one against these criteria. So the first thing is, is it commercially available? And this is like a, it's got a little star by it because if it's not commercially available, it's not in the report right now. It's not evaluated because over time we've seen plenty of companies that look at our high energy prices and they say, oh my, this is a perfect spot to market my new whiz-bang infinity machine that's going to make that's going to make energy for everybody and it's going to run forever and it's going to be amazing and so we get a lot of people and companies coming up and trying to sell these things so this is not based on anything like that this stuff they have to have equipment available that you can buy that has a warranty that has a company behind it that will come and service it because otherwise we don't need it here and we don't this is not actually a good place to test out equipment because a when it breaks the service people have to come a long way to fix it and they often don't and b the environment here is actually quite challenging with the cold and the long distances and the lack of technical support in the remote places it's the last place that you want to try and test something you should get it working down south and then when you have it working and you've got a few installations then you can come and bring it here um, the other ones are the technical viability of it, like how well is it going to work in the north, and then the cost, then whether or not it would generate more employment in the north. Right now we're spending over $500 million on fossil fuels, on, on diesel. So $500 million a year is going for diesel down south. So if we could create, use some of that money to create local jobs, that's, a, that's like... 500 million is close to a, a, the same as a diamond mine. So that's, you can imagine how much employment you could create. Then we're also concerned about health. We don't want to use, a, use some sort of energy source that causes, for example, of the whole community to be full of wood smoke. That would, that would not be good in the end. Community self-sufficiency and other environmental impacts. And I'm going to back to costs for one point, because as Lise was saying in the introduction, the cost is an interesting question. If we take that we're going to do this, we don't need to compare the cost to current practice to the future, whatever is being proposed. We need to compare different renewable energies to each other to figure out which one is the cheapest. Because the cost of not doing this, well, you can talk to an insurance company if you take the business, comp business perspective. An insurance company will tell you the cost of trying to continue the path we're on is going to be enormous. So this study we look at the cost of each renewable compared to the other renewables, but business as usual is not on the table. It just can't be. So now we're going to get in, as I said, we start first with commercial availability. So these are the things that are currently commercially available and they're here in the Northwest Territories. And these are pictures mostly, except for this one with the grass, um, of, of things in the north. This is the wind turbine that's out at the diamond mines. This is solar in Colville Lake. These are wood pellets off the internet. Um, <laughs> that's, I think, down by Fort Smith. And so these are all things that we have right now. And they're working here. And there are others um, <clears throat> that we could use locally, but we don't know of any exa very many examples of it right now. Um, for example, geothermal, there's, there's some studies that say that there's some heat in the ground, especially focused around Fort Simpson. Uh, but no one's ever drilled down far enough to find out if that's really true. But there's a lot of excitement about it. So the ones in, with the pictures are things that we're already using. Then this next round would be things that are commercially available, but we'd have to import them. So again, renewable energy, some people think means entirely local in the Northwest Territories. And it could be, but sometimes there would be stuff that's available cheaper down south. So wood pellets is one. Um, jet fuel, this is probably the most challenging thing to think about how we're going to run on renewables is aircraft because you don't you really want that to be reliable and they've spent a lot of effort over the last 50 60 70 years figuring out how to make them reliable but 
Jet fuel, there's already biojet fuel out there, and, and there are companies like Alaska Airlines that's flying on 50% biojet fuel already. And so it's possible. And biogas is an interesting option. There's, it's basically just methane from, from farms or from organic waste streams. And methane is methane. It's the same as it's natural gas. It's the same thing. And so there are vehicles in Europe, for example, in the Netherlands, where they have a lot of natural gas, more than half of their cars run on natural gas already. They have a different kind of gas tank with compressed gas in the back. And so running vehicles on methane is, is dirt simple. It's easy. We just need to find a, a, a source down south that could supply the biogas. It's there. So those are the, the options that kind of made it into the study as passing the commercially available test. If, they didn't, if they're not for sale, then they didn't get into the study. So these are the ones that are technically viable, commercially viable. So then the next thing to figure out is, is it technically viable in the north? And you remember I was talking about the supply, matching the supply with the demand. So this, we have, we're talking about the supplies. These are our demands, right? We've got buildings and homes, aircraft. Remember that industry is enormous and transportation is enormous. So we have to find things that will work for all those places that we're using that kind of stuff. And this is kind of like a little diagram showing basically how we get most of our energy now. So it's coming up, everybody knows these things, B trains of fuel coming up the highway. It goes to a fuel tank farm. And from there it goes to diesel generators. Fuel goes to heat buildings. Fuel goes to get in our vehicles, planes, and up to the mines. The only exception is hydro and a little bit of wind that's fed from local, from the reservoirs and generates power and goes into buildings. So this thing, these are always hidden on the edge of town. You might not think about them very much, but they're really important. This is the tank farm offers energy storage that will give you, you know, obviously you can put enough fuel in it and keep it there over the whole winter. If you have a winter road, you can get your fuel in and keep it in the tank farm until the next winter road. And that is very different than some of the options we're looking at with, say, solar power. Solar power you can generate, obviously, when it's sunny or wind when it's windy, and you can store it in a battery, but there's no battery right now that can compete with this, with this tank farm. And that is, we're going to get into that, because <clears throat> that's the way we're running things now. And now here is, I was telling you about studies that are done for Canada. How is Canada going to run on 100% renewable energy. There have been studies done, and even the Liberal government kind of gathered up those studies and put them in a document, and when they were in Morocco just recently for the next meeting of the climate people, they put this thing, Canada's mid-century long-term greenhouse gas strategy. And in the rest of Canada, they're saying, well, look, our, the main thing that uses power is air conditioning, in a lot of our provinces, so it peaks in the summertime when it's sunny. They have a lot of energy used for vehicles, industry, and heating. And basically, the, the summary of what they're saying we should do is we should change everything to electricity. Cars should go on; it should be electric, and you should use subways and electric trains. And we're going to switch heating over to electricity because you can use heat pumps, which use only a third of the power to generate the heat. And they say, well, we've got this big electric grid, so what we're going to do is hook everything up to the electricity, and then we're going to generate as much renewable electricity as we can, so solar and wind. And so this is showing this map of Canada. You see the little white lines? That's the whole transmission grid, all of the electrical lines that connect everything together. And the little dots, all these orange dots, and all these, see some of these are even coming out way up north in Quebec. So they're coming from the big hydro Quebec reservoirs and hydro systems way up here. So all of that is, the, the plan for Canada is to connect, this is all connected together. So you can use wind from wherever it's, where it's green is where it's windy. And where it's bright yellow is where it's sunny. And connect that, feed that into the grid and then use the hydro dams to hold water back 
So when it's not sunny, you run the hydro, and when it's not windy, you, you can use hydro. And when it is sunny, you use solar, and when it's windy, you use the wind. And by that, they're going to switch the whole country to run on electricity. That's, that's what it says in this document that they, that they presented in, in Morocco. And so that's reasonable for Canada, the rest of Canada, where everybody lives crowded along the American border down here anyway. But this is where we live, up here. And so you can see right there, there's a bunch of little, little white lines. That's Yellowknife and then North Slave Grid. And there's a couple of white lines down here. That's our South Slave Grid. None of it's connected to the rest of this, and it's miles away. So they've looked at some studies. The government has looked at connecting us into the Southern Grid, and it's way expensive. So the reason why I'm talking about this is because when you listen to the news and you listen to the media or you go online and you look at stuff, Everyone's talking about this, and the states have a similar idea, right? They want it, they're all connected together too, and they want to, they've got even more solar and wind, and they, so they can do that. But we shouldn't fall into that trap and think that, that we can do the same thing. We're different, we're remote. It's really, it's really easy to draw lines on the map and say, okay, we're just gonna connect this to this. That right there is a billion dollars, because it's just too far. So, and then the other problem is when you get there, there's not that many people there, or even in the mine that you get to is, doesn't take that much power. So you're trying to pay for this billion dollar transmission line with a small amount of power consumption. So we need to do something different. So that's, yeah, that's what I'm talking about here. But basically, this scenario that I was talking about is called the solar, wind, and hydro, or sun, wind, and water scenario. And that seems like a pretty reasonable solution for Canada, but for us, there's these problems, engine technical problems with it. The transmission lines are gonna be super expensive. The hydro systems we have, in the rest of Canada, they have mountains, and they can have quite big reservoirs in those mountains, and they can store enough energy to run Canada for, for a year or even a couple of years. Our systems are in, you look outside, it's not very mountainous. So we don't have that much capacity. And you see that here, when we have a drought for six months, we run out of water. And that's what's happened in the snare system here. The last couple of years, we didn't have enough water. The level went down and we had to switch to diesel. So we can't use that hydro to store the same way the rest of Canada can. Our highest demands are in the winter when the sun is not shining. This is a big problem. And wind, if you go back and look at that map, see, this is Labrador, this is where I grew up. And it's when, it, when you say it's windy, it's, you, you put a ball cap on and you go outside and you do your head like that, your hat goes off and it's across the street. That's how windy it is. And so when people say, oh, but it's windy here, it's breezy here. <laughs> but it's not enough to generate the kind of power that, re, that you really need. So it's windy maybe out on the Arctic coast, maybe in the middle of Great Slave Lake, there's a few places where there's a bit of wind, out at the mines as well. So solar, wind, and hydro, we could, it can contribute more, that's for sure, but it's not gonna be the answer, the, the, the single answer, like it, it's becoming in the rest of Canada. So warning when you listen to the news or when you hear things like that, it's like remember that we're not quite in the same boat. So how do we get to remote communities, aircraft, highway transport, and industry, if we can't use those solutions. And it seems like the, the, the other option that we have to look at is biofuels, because they have the same property that diesel has, the wonderful tank farm, where you can put diesel in it and you can keep it for a couple of years and you can supply your community. You can do the same thing with wood pellets. It's actually even cheaper because you can just use a grain silo and if you spill them, you just get a broom and sweep them up. So you don't have to build a million dollar, multi-million dollar tank farm. You can use a couple hundred thousand dollars for some farm equipment and you can store them in grain silos. And the same could be also said, we think, for biogas. There's, um, there's a lot of um, also potential with biodiesel and ethanol as fuels. You might have heard of those. It's fuel made from... From, our, from organic sources, like basically biodiesel comes from cooking oil and ethanol is just alcohol. 
but both of them have trouble in the cold and um, also might have trouble with storing it for a long time. They don't store as well as diesel. So they could be possible, but we definitely need to research more. How are we going to actually use those? In the meantime, like I was saying, gas, biogas, I don't think it freezes because it's a gas. So, and you can store it for long times. So we're already doing it in Inuvik where this is a truck that's running on liquid natural gas and it's hauling liquid natural gas and it's going to Inuvik to run the, the generator station up there. So this isn't biogas, this is regular gas, but there's no difference, it's just where you get it from. So as infrastructure develops down south, where they start to make biogas more available that they generate from organic waste down there, then we could truck it up here. So, all of that said, Remember back to the list of all the criteria. So we've covered, we've covered technical viability and commercial availability. Now we're looking at the other criteria, the cost and local environmental impacts and employment. And this is, I'm just going to run through now what, what came out at the end. And a big part of this is that those criteria were selected, but you could have other criteria and it might have slightly different result. So for air, I think the only choice right now is biojet fuel. And you'll have to look, it's got similar issues to, the, to biodiesel. So we have to start slowly and work, work our way up. But like, like we said, Alaska Airlines is running on 50% biodiesel or biojet fuel already. So I think we could work our way up there. Then on the highway, for highway driving, you need to be able to go long distances and really long distances here. So in some cases, say in the South Slave, They've got excess hydro down there. They, there's, there's water spilling over the reservoir. It makes total sense they could have electric cars. And this is uh, the Electric Energy Alliance, the electric car. And it is, you can't see, but it's, uh, it's in the South Slave. And there's also, a, a, I've seen on the news, there's a Tesla in Hay River that this guy drives up and down to high level on one charge. So it's possible. And then the other solution would be the biogas. There's a biogas truck. Um, we also have to look at barging, or we did until NTCL collapsed, but we may still need to barge around. So the same thing for that, you could use biogas. So in town transport, even more, we could do electric vehicles. We could do that here in Yellowknife. We could do it definitely down in the South Slave. And as we start to co connect more communities to renewable power systems, then there could be more electric vehicles in communities too. But then also biogas. And so another thing, if you want to have a truck, you can have a truck, no problem. It can run on biogas, that's fine. You don't have to get a, a if you don't like a little electric car, no problem, you can have biogas. And the same for, for big trucks, for big hauling. Heat, heat is relatively easy um, because you can do it with wood. Either wood, firewood, wood chips, wood pellets, this is a picture of a tank, a pellet storage facility in Norman Wells. So that's showing that it's already being moved to communities that don't have um, all weather roads or, so they have, Norman Wells gets a barge in the summer and then has a winter road. So they're able to store enough energy in the, pellet in the, in the silos to get through those gaps, not a problem. And a little plug, this is what I've been doing for the last couple of years, is building a house which is super insulated and it's heated just with wood. Actually, Wade's here. Wade lives, Wade lives in this part, and I live in this part with my wife. And even today, it was minus 25 today. I put a little fire on in the morning, and then the sun came out, and I didn't need to put any more heat on for the rest of the day because it's got walls like 13 inches. It uses two cords of wood, 600 bucks to heat. So it can be affordable, and it, you can use local resources. We get our wood from Betchico, and support a bit of local employment. So that's pretty good. Electricity, I gotta take a couple slides to get through that because everybody likes to talk about it. I put it last because it is the smallest user of fossil fuels, but it still is a little more complicated. So in the North Slave, around Yellowknife, we could expand the hydro system that we have now. In particular, I think we need to put more storage in there if we can, which would help us get through these periods of drought. It's 
needs more research for sure, but I've seen some studies saying there are some, some lakes on the system that could be used to help store more water and help us get through longer periods when there's low water. And people have started putting solar power on to the Yellowknife grid. There's lots of homes now that have them. Even the city's been putting some up. And that, it's debatable what that does. In a low water year, it definitely helps. But then as the water comes back up, you end up just spilling the water over the top of the dam when it's full. And if you add more solar, you just spill more water. But as we start to add more, say we start to add electric vehicles onto the grid and maybe other stuff, then you're going to need more power. So then one interesting thing would be if we had a couple of buildings that were using wood to heat but also to generate power, which is possible, then that complements solar power really well. So in the summer when you're not heating, you can use solar to power things. And then in the winter as the heating system comes on, it starts to generate power as well. That's called like combined heat and power or cogeneration. So if we had a few buildings that were running on that, it would complement the solar and we might, we might be able to start doing that. South Slave, they've got tons of hydro. They've had it for years and it's spilling over the dam all the time. So they could use that to, to run heat pumps because down there the ground is soft. It's easy to put in ground. Uh, you put pipes in the ground and you can draw heat out of the ground with the electricity. Like I said, they should be running, easy to run electric cars down there. And because we were required to have a backup for, for all the hydro, we, the same thing, they could put in some systems that are combined heat and power with wood chips, then they would have that as a backup if the hydro went out. Now the rest of the communities and the mines, I think the mines come as their own thing, but it's more challenging because they're all spread out all over the place. But generally, yeah, we can do it with either with wood pellets. In some places, there's, there's, Mike, there's small hydro available. Solar power could complement the system for sure and wind power where it's windy. So you take a combination of what, what's available in each community, but the, the backup would, to be renewable would likely be wood pellets. And we chose wood pellets here because of the criteria is to use local sources of energy. And there's a, plant, there's a proposal to put a wood pellet plant in Enterprise and use local wood. But you could also use biogas again. And that's, that would match well with what Power Corp is doing already in Inuvik with, with liquid natural gas. You could also do it with, uh, with biogas. Same with the mines, basically. The trouble with the existing mines is that they, they don't really know how much longer they're going to be open, so they're hesitant to invest in new technology. But if there's a new mine, then they should, that's the opportunity to, to put them onto renewables. And this, they have the same options that the rest of our communities do. Wood pellets, biogas, hydro. So, we're getting to the end. I promise. Um, so this is Remember, this is the old, the old mix that we showed at the beginning. 80% imported, mostly diesel. This is what happens when you put what I was just talking about. You put it all into one big piece, of, one big graph. And what we're basically saying, remember back here, this was the 10% roughly that was, that was electricity. So we expanded it a bit because we're going to add some electric vehicles. We doubled the hydro from 4 to 8%. And then we said, okay, the other will also add wind and solar power 2% each. And people are disappointed by that because they really like solar. But you have to remember that this, is, this solar and wind make electricity. And the whole piece of the pie for electricity was 10%. And half of that was hydro. So it doesn't leave you much space to, to fill a whole lot of solar PV panels. They're doing a great job. They're doing exactly what we want them to do. They're helping provide renewable electricity. Now we have to worry about the rest of the picture. And so we're looking at wood and wood pellets providing all this heat and it can also be used to generate electricity for the aircraft, jet fuel, and then for long distance transport mining equipment, you're going to get, have to import biogas from somewhere down south. But there you go. That's 100% renewable energy. 
using existing this all stuff that's basically off the shelf. So, getting there by 2050, that's the challenge. And part of the argument is, well, yeah, we can't do all of that at once, but at, as, as every piece of infrastructure comes up for renewal, because over the next 30 odd years, almost all the power plants are going to need to come up for replacement. Many buildings, they, certainly the heating systems will come up I would like to see a car still driving around in 30 years that's driving around now. So everything's going to be replaced at least once between now and 2050. So when we do that, that's the time to put a renewable system in. Because the extra cost won't be, won't be nearly as much as putting in another diesel thing and then finding, finding out 10 years later that the, government, the federal government's going to force you to pay a $200 carbon tax or something like that. It goes back to that picture of all the world leaders. If they're really going to do this, then the price of carbon, the, the tax on fuel, is going to go up. It's going to have to go up. And the, the thing that I see is that we've seen climate change happening here in the north already. We're kind of getting used to it. But the rest of the world, it's starting to hit them now. And when it really hits them, the, the $10 a ton carbon tax that we're seeing now is nothing compared to what's going to happen when they realize, you know, if climate change starts affecting food supplies and things like that for the rest of the world, then they're going to get serious and we're going to, we're going to get dragged along with this. So we might, even if you're a total skeptic from a business perspective, this is coming. So you might as well skate to where the puck is going to be, not where the puck has been. <laughs> Which is apparently a quote from Wayne Gretzky. So, like every good Canadian thing, we end with hockey. And yeah, the rest of it, I, that's what I've already said. So that is the end of the presentation. Um, it's fitting we're in the great hall of the Legislative Assembly. There, is, there are consultations going on still. Um, you can call this number. I called it this morning and they didn't know, <laughs> they didn't know why I was calling. But it's actually a, the number of John um, Vandenberg, who's the Assistant Deputy Minister at Public Works in charge of energy. And they have it on their website as the number to call if you want to comment. And of course, you should talk to the, the people that go in, in there. And like I said, full report, this thing you can find on the Alternatives North website. And you can call me too if you want. Um, thank you. <laughs>